Good evening and welcome once again to this program, Making the Case. I am extremely pleased and privileged to be here with you this week once again. Allow me to please welcome all of you who are joining me on television across the country. Welcome to those of you who are joining me on Facebook Live. Welcome to those of you who are joining me on Freedom Radio. I'm very pleased to be coming to you this evening. And as usual, I will ask those of you who are watching from Facebook to please share this live program so that we can reach as many people as possible, as far and wide as possible. Now tonight, as usual, we have a packed program. So I'm going to go straight into the program. As you know, it's, we usually run out of time on the, on the program because there is um, no shortage of topics or events which we can discuss that is taking place in our country. And on this program, we pride ourselves with ensuring that we bring you all of the facts of every situation of all of the issues that we are facing in our country or, or as a government and keep you abreast with everything that is taking place in our country and ensuring that you have the correct and accurate information. And I do all of that while I make my case for any particular topic or any line of thinking or, or reasoning that I wish to present to the population and to those of you who are joining. Now tonight, we are going to discuss a few things. We're going to discuss squatting. We're going to talk briefly about the no confidence motion that has been filed um, against Aubrey Norton by a faction of his own party, the, the Florida chapter. And then um, also the COI is continuing into the election rigging and I and I hope that as many of you as possible is tuning in every day so that you can get a first hand look and you can listen for yourselves as to what took place during the elections of March the second and in the months the days that followed in the Ashman's building and then the months that that followed thereafter. So it's not the PPP you're hearing it from, but you're hearing it directly from the people who were involved in that process, people who were present during the whole saga of the election rigging. Um, before I, I go into our substantive topic for this evening, I just want to briefly address a letter that I saw in the Kaichur News today a, a letter that was submitted by a M. Perry, which um, the, the, writer, the, the writer of the letter accused me of misuse of government database when I spoke about the mayor, Ubraj Narain, acquiring a house lot through the, the, the government housing program, even though he had, he is the owner of at least two properties uh, prior to receiving that allocation. Now clearly this person, Perry, has never been involved in a land transaction because he or she would know that information regarding land is public information. And so it was the mayor himself who disclosed the location of where his property is. And of course, it's in his name. And so any check of um, the land registry or a deeds registry will reveal the truth of the, of the matter. And so there is freedom of information under section 141 subsection one of the Land Registry Act in relation to certificates of title and section seven, subsection N of the 
Deeds Registry Act in relation to transports. So Mr. Perry is completely incorrect in his claim that any database was used to access this information. There was no government database per se that was used to access this information. It is public information and if you are, let's say for example, a private citizen is entering into an agreement of sale for a property and the person who is the vendor provides you with a copy of a title or a transport. Any prudent purchaser who is desirous of entering into an agreement of sale will approach an attorney or will approach the deeds registry or the land registry directly and seek from them a copy, a certified copy of the ownership documents in relation to that property. And he or she is entitled to access a copy of that certificate of title or that transport, depending on what type of land uh, you're purchasing, whether it's covered by title or transport. So this is public information. And there was no misuse of any government database, as the writer uh, claims. So I don't want to spend time to have to write a written response and, and to, to give that, um, to justify that with any written response. I just thought I'd take a few minutes and just clear that up quickly. But I know most people have entered into some agreement or another in relation to land. And, and most people know that this information is public information. So that is in relation to the letter in the Kaichur News. Now, tonight, I want to address squatting for a bit. Not the situation that took place at Mocha or the squatting that took place at Mocha because I believe that that, that situation there has been ventilated. I spent a lot of time on this program explaining all of the measures that we took to reach out to those persons, all of the offers that were made. We went through all of that, the compensation package, the housing, the, housing, the free land, the, the land for, for their sustained livelihood for agriculture purposes and so on. Everybody's aware of the steps that were taken there. And so I don't want to rehash that but tonight I want to focus on two approaches of two parties, the APNU, AFC Coalition, and the People's Progressive Party Civic uh, Administration or, or, or Government. And I want to compare and contrast. This is making the case. So I am making my case tonight once again, and I will show you, I will demonstrate to you through video evidence and through explaining my reasons as to the two approaches as it relates to squatting by both governments, the AP and UAFC coalition when they were in office and the People's Progressive Party civic government. Now I'm going to open up by showing you a video of a man we don't see very often or hear from very often, former President Granger. I'm going to open with him and then I will show you uh, the progression of how, first of all, the promises that were made by the APNU AFC coalition as it relates to squatting. Then I will show you what their approach was when they were in office to squatting, what they did and did not do. And then I will show you what real leadership is, and that is under the PPPC. So have a look at this short clip from President Granger as he then was during a campaign speech. I have a plan for families. You know, I know some people are forced by poverty and circumstances 
to squat. Sometimes they live in slums. Sometimes they live in shanties. Right now in Guyana, this beautiful country, there are 178 squatter settlements. We inherited 178 squatter settlements from the PPP. From the Minister of Housing and Water, the Minister of Squatting, at Beirut, over 416 families, at Timeri, 183 families, at Cainville, 1,089 families, at Vigilance, 223 families. I can't go on like that. We have to change things. And APNU AFC is changing things. So that was a former president, Granger, during a campaign uh, rally, political rally, speaking about regularizing or addressing the squatting situation in our country. Now, he started off by saying that circumstances force those persons to squat. So what are these circumstances that he is referring to? You would assume that he is perhaps talking about some kind of bad policy under the PPP, for example. But there is a history to squatting, and that's what he's not expanding on. So during the Burnham era, during the years that we were under a undemocratic rule, there was no housing program in our country. And everybody knows that when the PPP came to government in 1992, under the leadership of Dr. Chedi Jagan, the housing program, a national housing program was started with little to no money because we inherited a bankrupt economy. And with little to no money, the PPP recognized the importance of delivering affordable housing to our people. And this is also to give life to our constitution where uh, people are entitled to affordable housing. Now, during those years, the 30 years prior, to Dr. Jagan becoming president, there was no housing program and therefore people had no other option but to squat. There was no organized or any program, any organized program to, to acquire affordable housing. So people were forced to squat. They had no other option. Recognizing that we have a huge squatter problem in terms of a population, the size of, of squatting across the country, in 2001, an inventory of all squatter settlements were ordered. And we found that there were 216 squatter settlements across our country located in various areas in various regions, 216. Of that 216, the People's Progressive Party civic successive PPPC administrations were able to regularize 176 of those settlements, informal settlements we call them, or squatter settlements. We were able to regularize over the years 176 of those settlements. The others that, were, that we were unable to regularize are located in areas that are zero tolerant. And by that I mean areas such as reserves, road reserves, or, or uh, along, located along conservancy dams, or located on land that is not suitable for housing. So several reasons could could attribute the area being uh, termed a zero tolerant area. And in that case, those squatters who are there 
on the, on, in those settlements will have to be removed. So they will have to be relocated. We are unable to regularize them, not by choice, but because of where they are located. So those are the ones that you would see that from time to time, we would have to remove squatters, depending also on the urgency of the situation. And that is how come we got to Caneview, um, the squatters at Caneview, which is referred to as Mocker because it's an extension of the Mocker scheme there. So that's how we got to that particular area. And you would have heard Granger during that, that uh, presentation there mention Caneview. But he didn't do any proper research because you would see he would have been told that that is a reserve and it could never uh, be regularized because it was always reserved um, for the passage of that road dating back to the early 2000s as well. He also mentioned a particular community, Beirut. And you would recall that it was myself only last year who went to Beirut completed the regularization process there and, and commenced the distribution of title to the residents in that area. There are over 300 households there and we have started to sign people up for their titles and distribute titles there in that community, uh, predominantly an, an Afro-Guyanese community. But this is what I'm showing you with Granger and with the whole APNU AFC cabal. You cannot trust what these people are saying. You cannot believe for a second anything that they say because there is never any action to support anything that they say. You know persons who have been following this program from its inception. We have discussed and dissected and analyzed manifestos from the APNU AFC and every page is just filled with unfulfilled promises made by the coalition and nothing came to fruition. So I don't understand how you can have a political party or you can have leaders who have, who can go to communities even today and make promises to people. It's unbelievable that they are still given a platform because they have no credibility, they have no integrity, and they have no track record of which to speak of. So this was the promises, part of the promises that, that Granger made. And his, his plan for squatting reminds me of the plan that he said that's in his pocket. Do you remember he was on a platform and said, oh, I have the plan for the development of Guyana and the, and the future of Guyana, it's in my pocket. And he was patting his leg. I mean, when you, when you recall these things, it's hilarious. It's, 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 it's fiction. You would think it's fiction because the truth is stranger than fiction. Um, in a lot of times in the things that we have seen and heard, uh, from the APNU AFC coalition. And um, it's just, it really is sad and funny at the same time when you, when you listen or you recall some of the things that they said during that time. Now, this next clip that I'm going to show, so I'm building, I'm building my case. This next clip that I'm going to show you is from a report from the Prime News, Adam Harris is reporting, and this describes to you um, what took place in Sophia under uh, the APNU AFC government. Central Housing and Planning Authority moved against squatters in South Sophia this morning. The exercise began shortly after sunrise. A spokesperson for the Central Housing and Planning Authority said that the people were served notice a while back, some as far as last year. In fact, the demolition was attempted last year in the presence of the police, but the people attacked the group, forcing a halt to the exercise. 
Some of the people who opposed the demolition had already been issued land. Some promised to vacate the plot since last year. All told, 21 structures were demolished. Some of them appeared to have been abandoned. But the exercise saw residents fetching things out of their homes into the property to be demolished, claiming that the property was occupied. Clayton Hines, a community leader, was there when the demolition crew descended on a field of fire. I think this exercise is a good one. Let me just say, good in the sense of putting it in quotation marks. One, it is a necessity. Because my understanding as a community leader is that there is a plan for, to improve the standard of living. To improve the environment would demand an end to squatting. If drains and thoroughfares are to be developed, then squatting has to end, said Heinz. Good. Now, I want you to stay with me. I am not showing you what was done under APNU AFC to justify what took place at Mocha. Stay with me, please. I'm not showing you that to compare and contrast the action that was taken at Mocha under our government. I'm showing you what takes place when you have people who need to be removed and refuse to be removed. And worse yet, when you have bad political actors who go into situations like that and add fuel to fire. And that is what took place at Mokko. But stay with me, I'm not finished with the, the, the evidences yet. So I'm going to ask my operator, I think you have two, two videos, one from the newsroom and one with former Minister Valerie Patterson speaking. I want you to show both of them and then come back to me. Scores of squatters stood with placards outside of the Central Housing and Planning Authority's breakdown office demanding redress after their houses were destroyed following a demolition exercise by the agency. The government didn't get nobody no notice or not. Them just come breaking down, come break down and break down my shop without saying queer. When we go outside, it's like you can't even send on because them like then supposed to give you a notice when you're breaking down and the business help you out a lot. I have two kids to look after. Where them want we for go? We don't have nowhere for go. Them got to study the little babies and we rest the baby them. Inside the jewel, we better a, a time polling and whatsoever. The government, why we the government need we to go on TV? We can't go on TV. If we go on TV, they will put me in jail. We need house lots. When they put me after, where will we go? What will we do? We have nowhere to go. I have kids. Why put them in children? Granger, we vote for a change, but this is not what we want. We cannot maintain you on the reserve. You have to get off. Reserve in reserve. Not for you to live on, not for you to put your shop on, not for you to put anything. So prepare to get off. So remove peacefully. Because as I said at the beginning of this meeting, we have to do what we have to do, and you also have to do what you have to do. Are we in agreement with this? Yes. So help your neighbor to move. If you don't move, not one letter will be issued on the 24. Right. So, according to the people in that clip, they were not consulted and they were not offered any alternative in relation to housing so they weren't given any house lots or anything now i don't know whether that is true or not if the government didn't offer anything this is the ap and new afc administration perhaps they did i don't know perhaps they did and those persons re refused to move what i do know is that under our government we did make those offers we did engage those persons at Mocha as well as the, the NDC there for in excess of a year. And we have evidence to show that those consultations were posted publicly 
and people knew that the negotiations were going on, and you could see evidence of us offering help to people because 28 families took the assistance. 28 families saw that this was an opportunity to improve their lives, to regularize their housing situation, to become true and lawful landowners, and they seized that opportunity. And they have moved on with their lives, which was a smart thing to do, to look out for yourself and not to listen to so-called leaders in your community who only want to exploit your suffering for political gain. So the concern was never for the people of Mokka under the, the, by the leaders of AP and UAFC. That was not their concern. Their concern there was to go and get political mileage, to go and to, to use what is taking place there and to call it racial discrimination. Now they broke squatter settlements too. They broke houses too. And I'm not saying that they were wrong to do that because squatting is illegal. You didn't see any PPP leader run in the middle of that situation and, and, or throw themselves down and, and roll around the place and say, oh, they're discriminating against you, you're poor people or you're Afro-Guyanese. Look what they're doing to you. Look what your Afro-Guyanese leaders are doing to you. They're breaking fellow Afro-Guyanese homes. We didn't do that. That is irresponsible leadership. We cannot condone an illegality. Now we may sympathize with the people who, whose structures are being broken. We can sympathize with them, but we wouldn't go adding fuel to the fire there. So you can't see any PPP leader intervening in that situation and making irresponsible remarks just to gain cheap political points. That is not what leadership is about. We are very, very consistent in the People's Progressive Party Civic. So I want to show you now a clip from a clip where you will see, you will see President, our President now. Um, you will see him in that clip, and you will see our General Secretary and Vice President, Barra Jagdeo. And I would have spoken on this program as well about um, the APNU AFC shortly after attaining government in 2015, um, launched an attack on the vendors at Stabrook Market and they broke stalls there on the 1st of May, it was a holiday, it was a wee hours of the morning. They went in there and they broke stalls without making alternative arrangements for the people there to sell and to continue their livelihood. Now that situation, uh, uh, where when that was going on, that particular incident was visited by our General Secretary. And I want you to listen there's a lot of background noise, but I want you to listen very carefully to what our General Secretary and now Vice President Barajagdio says to this vendor. Now he said there that we are not opposed to cleaning up the city. We are not opposed to cleaning up the city. But we want to ensure we will advocate for you to have somewhere to sell. He never said to that person, you have a right to be there, you have a right to sell, you, you and they are discriminating against you. Uh, because you're a vendor and he didn't throw himself down any uh, under any trucks and, and prevent anybody from from being removed or throwing himself down in mud and causing a whole ruckus very calmly spoke to the vendor and explained 
that they have to make alternative arrangements for you and we will advocate for that. But we're not against cleaning up the city. That, my friends, is responsible leadership. That is what you get with a People's Progressive Party civic government versus what you will get from the APNU AFC coalition and its so-called leaders. So I didn't come here tonight to debate whether squatting is illegal or not or not. Squatting is illegal. And in instances where people have to be relocated for national development, they can always count on consultations with our government. And nobody's plight or suffering will ever be exploited by the leaders of the PPPC administration, whether in government or out of government. Comrade Barajag Deo there was in opposition. He was the opposition leader. He could have done all kind of manner of things to gain attention and to try to garner support. He could have said things that would be popular. He could have made promises in that moment that would have resonated with the vendors. He could have said to them, you know, if you elect us, you all can continue to sell here. And we will not remove any one of you. That would have been popular to see. And that may have garnered some interest or maybe even some votes from the vendors. But in his wise leadership, he knows that that situation, there is an illegality there. They're occupying the space illegally. Some of them, for example, leg illegally. And so he's not condoning that. He, he's simply explaining to the vendor there that in a situation like that, there has to be alternatives, an alternative area found for you so that you can continue your livelihood. And that is precisely the approach that we took in relation to the squatters at Cade View or Moko. We ensure that they can remove from there and move into not just uh, on a land but in a home that they were properly compensated for the structure that was there. Even though there were illegal structures, we still found it necessary because we care and, and, we're, and there is a genuine concern about the people there. And when some of them said they depend on this land for their livelihood, we ensure that we add to the package land for agriculture purposes, up to five acres, for them to go on to cultivate so that they can sustain their livelihood and grow their business. All of that rejected by a handful of those who are listening to bad leadership, who are listening to irresponsible leadership. Now, I think I saw somewhere today there is some um, GoFundMe or, or some kind of um, funds being raised or something to help the, this, the squatters there. That is incredible, incredible that the, the PNC or the, the, the APNU will think that they need to step in and help financially now when for over a year there is an offer on the table still for uh, the people there who have to be relocated. It's not that the government abandoned these people. So they are now stepping in like some kind of heroes, but we, we are seeing straight through them. And so I took the time to, to explain to you and to show you a difference in leadership. Not to say that squatting is right or wrong, we know squatting is illegal. And it is very unfortunate when you have to go move, make a move to break structures. But sometimes you are left with no option. Maybe when the squatters, uh, the settlements were, were broken, the structures were broken in Sapphire on the AP and UAFC, maybe they did consult. 
and the people refused, and so they were left with no other option. I don't know whether that was the case, but what I can tell you is that we made offers, very generous offers, and those were refused because there were people there who were stoking fear and, and, and uh, using divisive language and telling people that this is only happening because you are Afro-Guyanese and the PPP is discriminating against you. There's, they're, they're racist and this is because of racial discrimination. Ignoring all the times we went to Afro-Guyanese communities to distribute land, to distribute titles, and to develop those communities. So, and, and relocation is not something new. And it's not only in relation to informal settlements or in relation to squatting. Right now, as part of our national development, there are people having to be relocated. People who are legitimate, lawful landowners that we are in consultations with. Now these, these people are being, there is a, there's a, a group of us, there is a, a, a team that is meeting with people who are in the path of the pipeline, the gas to shore uh, pipeline, and they are being consulted with. Private landowners, these are people who took their money and purchased land through private transactions, who are legitimate landowners, who have transports and certificates of title. But because of the national development that is taking place because of the transformational projects, the gas to shore pipeline, the crane to Schoonard Highway that is being constructed in Region 3, the new uh, Demerara River Bridge. There is a team working with all of those people who are in the pathway of these projects. People who are, like I said, legitimate landowners. I walked the alignment with a, a team from CHPA who is engaging people since 2020 when, when we took office. There are some huge houses in the path where you have families living. These people took their hard earned money, bought those properties and are living there with their families. They didn't commit any illegality. but. Unfortunately, they are in the path of the bridge or the highway or the pipeline. And the government has to acquire that property so that the project can continue and get to completion. It's difficult for those people. You think it's not difficult? It's extremely hard for them to have to, see, to give up their home, a home that they would have known for years. Big fancy homes that some of them have built. We will have to demolish and they will have to be relocated. They will be compensated for the structure that is there and we're working with them to come to an amicable settlement. But lots of people, hundreds of people to, on these various projects that we have to consult with so that we can see these projects to completion. They're not kicking up a storm. They're not raising a ruckus. They understand that they do not have a choice in this situation. The government can compulsory acquire, compulsorily acquire the property. And so it is, they understand that the best option for them is to work with the government so that they can be properly compensated so that they can move on with their lives somewhere else. It is inconvenient. It is very inconvenient. But this is only temporary. As the country evolves, as we roll out these projects, many people will be inconvenienced. But it is all for national development. It is all for a greater good. All of those people who, when you go on Facebook, 
every day and you see them complain about the traffic on the East Bank, we are working to fix that situation. We are working on the Hags Bosch Road so that people can divert through there and get to their homes quickly. People who live in Providence, people who live in Covent Garden, who are still in farm. We are working on the, while we're doing that, we're continuing with the four lane, the concrete four lane. That probably would have been close to completion by now if we didn't have the situation, the prolonged delay in Mokko. Because you, you can see that part of that highway was built already. And, and so it will be inconvenience for a short period of time, but it is all for the greater good. It is all for the relief of the thousands of people, tens of thousands of people who live on the East Bank. When the pipeline comes in, it will be to the benefit of all Guyanese when we can get uh, cheaper electricity, when our electricity bill can be cut in half it will be for the benefit of all of us, Afro-Guyanese included, Indo-Guyanese, everybody. It will be better for the entire country. No one will be left out from, from the benefits of that. So that is my case this evening, to compare and contrast leadership, leadership in very difficult situations. It's not easy to have to go and break homes. It's very difficult to have to make such a decision. It's not easy to make. We don't make that decision lightly, but our hands are completely tied. And we know that we tried everything possible to avoid such a, a, a situation, to escalate and to allow irresponsible people like Norton and, and all of his cohorts from, from the APNU AFC, from going in there to exploit that situation. And then when you hear Valerie Patterson spoke, as she did in the video that I showed a short time ago, what she's saying is correct. How she's saying it is very callous. And, and we have never spoken to people like that or addressed people like that. We have always spent time explaining to people. We have always spent time negotiating with people, consulting with people, not saying to them, you have to get off the reserve. A reserve is a reserve. Yes, we know that, but there is an approach. There is a better approach that you can take. So we didn't take that callous approach, but what I'm saying is in a situation where APNU were breaking stalls, Stavrov market and I showed you an example of when our leaders went there they didn't exploit the vendors or their suffering there um, for political gain Dr. Barjagdia was very measured and very practical in what he was saying to the vendor there so there is always a consistency in our messaging we would never condone an illegality in or out of government. We would never condone an illegality or say something that is popular because we are in, op in opposition. That type of leadership is measured leadership, it's responsible leadership, and it's consistent. That is the type of leader I can get behind. That is the type of leader that I got behind. And I'm very proud that we are now um, in government and can offer you a leadership that you can trust and that you can depend on. I don't think anybody in this country has to guess what a PPPC administration would do. I think people can, can guess and assume based on our track record how we would handle any particular situation because we have been consistent in the way we deliver projects and programs and promises that we make to the people. And when we face a particular situation, we have always been consistent in our manner of handling that situation in a responsible way. Take for example, when we promise to 
restore the cash grant to our school kids. We could have said from an opposition standpoint to gain votes, the popular thing could have been as soon as we go back into office, $50,000 for every school child. And then do a different thing when we get into to government. Maybe just restore the, the 10000 and leave it at that. We didn't do that because we know it was a promise we cannot fulfill. Because we are responsible people. We said we will restore it and increase it incrementally to get to 50000 in five years. That is how you protect your integrity. That is how you protect your honor. You don't overpromise and then you can't deliver. You can underpromise and overdeliver, but never uh, to promise people things for political gain or to exploit people's suffering uh, from an unfortunate situation. And so that is the type of leadership that you can always trust and rely on from any leader in our party. So while Norton is in, was in Mocha calling the, the PPP racist and, and accusing us of racial discrimination, he himself was being accused of being a racist, from, not from outsiders, but from people within his own party. And you would have seen the article um, by the, the several news outlets about the treasurer, Mr. Marcelin, resigning and accusing Aubrey Norton of uh, racist, or as he says, discrimination and racial hostility and that he was him Norton was having the treasurer sign blank checks so this is Norton blank check Norton and you know when you get if you have Norton for a leader is a real blank check you have there Bl Norton himself is a blank check and and you know there is no telling what will happen or what you will get so poor Marceline, who's the, the, the treasurer, don't know what kind of trouble he may find himself in because he's signing blank checks and, and giving to Norton. So no accountability. Imagine this is his handling of the accounting records of his own party. He's not even accountable for that. How can we trust a man like this with the, the finances of a whole country? This, is, this party couldn't even elect a leader when they were electing uh, Granger, they was voting for Granger or Norton. There were allegations from within the party of rigging, of rigging of elections, internal elections. No wonder they, they rigged the national elections because this is what the people know, this is how they know to compete in an election, to rig it, not to win it by earning votes. So what you see here is exactly what will manifest itself in government. And that's exactly and precisely what they did in government, not Norton alone. The whole cabal of them. They're not accountable to anybody. So they're not even accountable for their own party finances. They're going to be accountable to the country's finances, with the taxpayers' money. And so even Roysdale Ford, when they were um, electing or uh, choosing between Harmon and Norton, Roysdale Ford um, was saying that we cannot use the word grassroots to, uh, let, me, let me say what it is, we must not use statements, we must not use euphemisms, we must not use the words grassroots to mean a return or an acknowledgement that the People's National Congress reform is a black people party. And this he, these comments he was saying when he was lending his support to Harmon and um, alleging that Norton is a divisive leader. And we have seen that clearly um, from his track record in the short time that he has been leader of the party. And it, it continue, and the evidence continues to mount about his his divisiveness, 
um, his incompetence and his lack of leadership. And so we saw a few days ago a no confidence motion filed um, against him by the Florida chapter of the PNC, the Florida arm. So very chaotic what is going on over there in the PNC camp. Um, Norton seems to be in some hot water over there. And this is, of course, because he is incompetent. He is, and, and he is divisive. And he is racist. So these are not outsiders calling him divisive and racist. These are his people. These are his supporters, card-bearing members of the PNC, calling him racist and divisive and incompetent. Because when you file a no-confidence motion against a leader, you're saying to them, we've lost confidence in you and your leadership. You are incompetent and you must go. That's what you're saying. And so that is what's taking place. Total chaos over in the Norton camp. So we have recently as well um, the very interesting developments in the COI. And we saw several people take the stand recently, high profile. Uh, people take the stand and I hope and I encourage people to please tune in as often as you can to the testimonies that are being taken at the, the Commission of Inquiry into the March 2nd election. Please follow it. Um, even if you, you've missed it, you can go back. It's available on, on Facebook. You can go back and watch. Now imagine the people who claim that their hands are clean. The people who we accuse and give evidence that they were integrally involved in trying to rig an election. Volda, for example, who signed the declaration, the Region 4 declaration, even though you're not required to sign. But her signature magically appears on the declaration that Mingo read out. Valda says, I'm, I'm innocent. She has always claimed, and they have always claimed that GCOM is an independent body and that they have nothing to do with election rigging. Okay? Tell that to the commissioners. Take the stand, tell that to the commissioners, and make your case as to why you had, why and how you had nothing to do with the election rigging. But instead, they take the stand, herself, Myers, uh, Carol Joseph, to say they're going to remain silent and they, they, they've invoked their right to remain silent, which is okay, which is their right to do. But it tells a story. And I hope people are paying attention too to the lawyer who is representing uh, four people at least that I know of, um, if I have, if I'm a politician and I'm being accused of being involved, directly involved in the rigging of an election, why would I want to be associated with the employees of GCOM or some of the other rigors of the election. I would want to be far removed from that. But instead, here, you have Carl Joseph, Valde Lawrence, and the people who they claim were completely independent. The GCOM staff, the CEO Lowenfield, the returning officer Mingo, you have the same attorney representing these four people. Carol Joseph, Valda Lawrence, Lowenfield, Mingo, Nigel Hughes. One lawyer representing the four of them. I wouldn't want anything or any association with Lowenfield or Mingo if I had nothing to do with rigging an election. 
I don't care if you found the best lawyer or which lawyer you found. I want no association with them if I am completely innocent and was not involved in the rigging of an election. They couldn't find any other legal representation. And they've always used common attorneys, whether it's Nigel Hughes or, or Rysdale Ford or um, the, the, I forgot the name of, of the other one, the older gentleman. Always use the same team of attorneys um, to represent them and their illegalities. But it's, uh, time will tell, they have been charged and um, they are before the courts. Now while we have cases being called up um, urgently in some matters, you have these that are yet to be called up. That is through no fault of our party of our, or of our government. The court system is responsible for that. And so we are anxiously awaiting those criminal proceedings to be called uh, before the court. People have been, persons have been charged. Um, evidence um, has begun to be taken. And, and so we are fully cooperating with any investigation and of course with the, with the COI so that we can speak freely as to what we saw, what we heard and, and exactly what took place on March 2nd because we want to ensure that this never takes place again. And so what is within our control, we did do and that is we made uh, changes to the representation of the People's Act so that we can ensure that future elections are free from this type of rigging attempt. So that is within our control. It is for the court to ensure that the cases are heard and if found guilty that um, these people who were involved in the election rigging are brought to justice. But what is within our control, we have done. So we have brought uh, reform to the, the representation of the People's Act to strengthen our election procedures and to ensure that future elections are more orderly, organized, uh, transparent, that people have access to information, that people will know immediately uh, the results of every polling station, that the SOPs be published that any Guyanese can be able to tally the results of the election and know who is um, the winner of the election. Those are the types of reforms that we took to the National Assembly that they made zero input. The APNU AFC, zero input. It was clear from the moment um, they started to speak that nobody read read the, the, the bill as it then was, the representation of the people's bill when we took it um, for amendment. So it was clear that they have no interest in insulating the electoral process from interference uh, for, and from future rigging because their ideology, their philosophy, their approach to elections is how can we tip the scale? What can we do to ensure or guarantee that we win the, the elections, whether we earn the votes or not? That has always, from time immemorial, their approach to election is always, how can we tip the scale? How can we guarantee a victory before the first vote is even cast. And that is what they try to do even in this 21st century. With the, starting with the appointment of Justice Patterson as the GCOM chair, the unilateral appointment of Justice Patterson. And they had a whole, they had the whole thing, at least they thought they had the whole thing um, planned out in their head but they didn't cater for 
um, this new breed of People's Progressive Party civic leaders who are not going to just roll over and, and allow them to steal an election and to steal a country. This is different times that we're living in. People could have seen for themselves what is taking place, the rigging that is taking place, and we were not going to give up and we were not going to stop fighting for the truth to come out. And so um, I, this is where I have to take my leave again. Uh, the operator has just signaled that I'm completely out of time. And I want to thank you once again. If you haven't shared this program as yet, please do so now so that we can get uh, as, many, as much coverage as possible. Thank you very much for joining me this evening. Please do join me again next week, same time, same place. God bless you.